Uh, yeah, well, um, I'm first of all, I'm delighted to be here, uh, or virtually at least. Sorry, I can't be with you in person. And thanks to Jason and the other organisers for inviting me. Um, uh, my name is David Farrier. I'm a professor of literature and the environment at the University of Edinburgh and um, a writer as well. And that's the thing I'm here to talk to you about, uh, um, my most recent book, Footprints in Search of Future Fossils. So, um, as I said, it's a pleasure to be um, joining you at least uh, today. And before we make a start, um, I'd like you to join me in an exercise in paying attention. Uh, we'll give a few minutes to this so you can take your time. So I'd like you to choose something nearby that you wouldn't usually notice, um, some kind of ordinary everyday object, something in the room, or perhaps that's visible outside it, or perhaps even if you prefer, you might bring to mind some familiar object that you don't have before you, but that you can picture. And I'd like you to give this thing your full attention. How many different senses can you engage? What characteristics do you notice? What role does it play in its surroundings, in its environment, or perhaps in your life? Also, what can you name that's true about this thing? That is, that is true for you. And also, what are you unsure of? What questions might it pose? So we'll just take a few minutes uh, to exercise our attention in this way. And then um, I'm going to start with a story. I'd like you to imagine that you could tell a story that would last for nearly 40,000 years. The Gunditjmara people of Southeastern Australia have a tale of four giants, creators of the early earth, who arrived on land from the sea. Three strode off to other parts of the country, but one stayed behind. He lay down and his body took the form of a volcano called Tapok in the Dawurud Wurrung language while his head became another called Budjabim. When Budjabim erupted, so the story goes, the lava spat out as the head burst through the earth, forming his teeth. The story occurs in the dreaming, the mythic time in which the world was made according to indigenous Australian cultures. But we can also place it in geological time. The discovery of a stone axe beneath tephra layers deposited when Budjabim erupted around 37,000 years ago suggests that humans were living in the area and therefore could have witnessed the eruption. It would have been sudden. Scientists think the volcano might have grown from ground level to tens of metres high in a matter of months, or even just weeks. Other Gunditjmara legends describe a time when the land shook and the trees danced. Budjabim could be the oldest continually told story in the world. Today, however, we have our own long story to tell. The climate emergency doesn't just affect those of us alive now, it reaches into the lives of many generations who have yet to be born. Sea level rise will take many hundreds of years to elapse. The last trace of our carbon won't be weathered from the atmosphere for perhaps 100 millennia. Jan Zalasevics, the chair of the Anthropocene Working Group, writes of technofossils, combinations of novel and natural materials and minerals that will form layers in the future fossil record. These anthropogenic lithologies vary wildly in scale, from entire cities of concrete and steel and glass to everyday objects, such as plastic utensils or even microscopic particles of fly ash. All these traces and legacies are stories told to the future. In writing footprints, I wanted to discover what kind of story we're telling. And in the book, I describe it as a practice of seeing or rather of enargeia. 
In the rhetoric of ancient Greece, Enargea described the capacity to speak of the future as though it were happening right now. The poet Alice Oswald translates Enargea as bright, unbearable reality. What it reveals to us is not always easy to face, but we have an opportunity and an obligation to face our impact on the deep future. Thinking about the things we're surrounded by as future fossils is a way to peer beyond presentism and visualize the deep time dimension of right now. And one of the things that really motivated me in writing this book was that sense that we have in effect entered into a, a radically different relationship with time and particularly with deep time by intervening in earth system processes uh, uh, with a kind of agency previously only seen on a kind of geological scale but also that our, our sense of connection to the deep past and the kind of deep future that we're reckoning with has radically changed as well um, there are, I think the current concentration of carbon in the atmosphere is around 414 parts per million. The last time there was that much concentration of carbon in the atmosphere was um, around 3 million years ago in the Pliocene era. And most of that carbon has been added um, in my lifetime. So the world that I have grown into um, as an adult is more like um, the world of the Pliocene, at least in terms of its atmospheric chemistry, than the world that my parents um, kind of brought me into, which I think is a, 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 an unsettling um, distortion of our relationship with deep time, to say the least. So what I'm going to do now is read from two parts of Footprints about the possible futures of plastic and nuclear waste and the kind of stories they might tell as a way to perhaps prompt us to think about the value of long-term thinking and of thinking about our legacies, our planetary legacies, our stories told to the future. Plastic is a miraculous substance. There has probably never been a material so receptive to making our desires real. But while plastic has been such an integral part of our story for the past 70 years, we rarely consider what story it has to tell of itself. This is down to how we have been encouraged, even trained perhaps, to perceive it. The earliest plastics were prized for their durability, but following the explosion in new plastic products following the Second World War, the plastics industry began to preach a gospel of disposability. In 1955, Life magazine ran an article celebrating throwaway life. And we know where this has got us. There are thought to be five trillion individual pieces of plastic in the world's oceans. So-called forever chemicals, long chain fluorocarbons produced in plastic manufacture are in the bodies of nearly every living thing on earth. Yet plastic tends to fall out of view when we aren't using it. And even when it's in use, it's easy to let plastic fade into the background of our senses. It's presented to us as a material without a past or a future. But the durability of contemporary plastics so much greater than the early synthetics means it is inevitably a deeply storied material. So in Footprints, I tell the story of a single PET bottle from its origins in the phytoplankton blooms of the Neotethys Ocean 145 million years ago to the future that follows when it is thrown into the oceans. In temporary oceans, I should say. In my story, this particular bottle is dropped in the Yangtze River and makes its way to the East China Sea. Caught in swift flowing currents, it enters the North Pacific Gaia where it joins countless other pieces of plastic waste. After 30 years, my bottle is briefly stranded on a Hawaiian beach until a storm carries it back out to sea, which is where we pick up the story. As it did when it last entered the water more than 30 years ago, the bottle again begins to attract a biofilm of microorganisms. 
but the sun has considerably weakened it, and even though seawater shelters it somewhat from ultraviolet light, the film can no longer protect the bottle from disintegration. Waves pound it. Crustaceans clinging to other hard plastics abrade it. Finally, the split seam along its side widens and the bottle breaks apart. The rough edges of its broken pieces attract more foulant and now considerably less buoyant, they begin to sink deeper until they fall below the point where sunlight can penetrate. The bottle's fate is now multiple. The molded base and neck are the first to sink. Other fragments persist near the surface long enough to be separated into smaller and smaller pieces until what remains of the bottle has become a host of thousands of microscopic particles. Because it does not biodegrade, the fragmentation of plastic can continue almost indefinitely down to the molecular level, but most of what was once the plastic bottle finds its way to the ocean floor before then in the bodies of dead fish or carried down by underwater currents. Larger shards and tiny particles alike circulate in undersea depressions, following the routes of submerged canyons and past sea mounts decked with torn polypropylene fishing nets. There are now too many pieces of the bottle to follow individually, perhaps too many even to count. So one piece will have to represent all the others. By now, the bottle has been in the water for more than 350 years. This particular fragment, no larger than a bead on a child's bracelet, drifts across the southern face of a vast seamount below the Hawaiian ridge, which holds the midway islands above the waves, and into the path of a copepod, a tiny crustacean with a cyclops eye in the centre of its head and long branching antennae. Rapidly spinning its swimming legs, the copepod generates a miniature feeding current, drawing microscopic dinoflagellates and plastic microfibers alike towards its mouth. The current catches up the sliver of bottle, which sticks to one of the copepod's legs, along with dozens of plastic pellets and polystyrene beads gathered up by its feet frenzied activity. When the copepod dies, its intestinal tract sealed by a coil of blue nylon small, smaller than an eyelash. Its body settles in a large cleft at the seamount's base and enters the last fragment of the plastic bottle in a rich deposit of thick mud and synthetic waste. Plastic debris is collected in this cleft for the past 400 years, encasing each fragment in an anoxic layer of sediment that will preserve it effectively for all time. Borrowing creatures will mix up the layer to some extent, leaving their own trace fossil paths, but not enough to prevent a deep seam of plastic from forming in the geological strata. After this, it is a familiar long story of heat, pressure and time. Over the coming millennia, hydrocarbons leach from the fossil plastic, accumulating in small deposits and setting in motion a slow chemical return to the bottle's origins in the rich, dark material patiently accumulated in subterranean chambers beneath the Neotethys Ocean. So um, I'd like to pause now with my stories. There's another to tell, but in a moment, I'd like you now to return to the object of your attention uh, where we began the session. Think about the object of your attention, whatever it was you chose, whether it's before you uh, or something that you brought to mind, and think of it as something that possesses its own story. What do you imagine was its life before it crossed your path? And what will its story be afterwards? Okay. Again, feel free to continue to reflect on that question uh, if you'd like to, but I will begin the second story now. So the story of the plastic bottle addresses one of the countless unintended stories we're telling the deep future. But there are also efforts to communicate deliberately across vast timescales. The problem of a safe long-term storage of nuclear waste has vexed engineers and politicians for decades. How do you convey a sense of danger across the distance of 10,000 years? 
Language is poorly adapted to communicate on this kind of timescale. Just like nuclear waste products, all words have a half-life, typically around 750 years. To take English as an example, in 10,000 years from now, it's thought that only 12% of the most basic terms currently in use, words like I, you, here, etc., will still be in circulation, if indeed English is still spoken at all, or something like English. Semiotician Thomas Seabook proposed a way to circumvent this erosion of language. He devised an atomic priesthood of experts who would guard the truth of the stored nuclear waste in a ritual designed to be handed down through generations. Every three generations, the message would be updated to keep pace with linguistic change. Other solutions bypass language altogether. At the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, in Carlsberg, New Mexico, the US plans to install 25-foot-tall granite monoliths decorated with human faces of disgust and revulsion modelled on Edward Munch's painting The Scream above the repository site. And we can see an example here, the idea being that um, the human face can, in an expression of revulsion or fear or disgust is a far more effective and universal communicator than any um, message couched in language. It's worth pointing out though, it, I only learned after writing Footprints that Munch's painting, The Scream, this famous image of, of existential anguish was meant to express not human angst, but in fact, the scream of nature. However, on Al Kiliwoto on Finland's Bosnian coast, engineers are taking a radically different, non-communicative approach. The repository they're building, called Onkelo, will store 120, 120 years worth of waste in tunnels carved 450 metres down in the bedrock. Cast in ceramic pellets, the waste will be housed inside 4.5 metre long copper canisters and buried deep in the rock. Once the repository is full, it will be backfilled to the surface and left unmarked to be forgotten. In writing Footprints, I was fortunate enough to visit Onkelo and the extract I'm about to read describes what it was like to stand in one of the deposition tunnels. But first, to make sense of the story I'm about to tell, you need to know another story, that is the story of the Sampo. In the Finnish folk epic, the Kalevala, there is the story of how the blacksmith Ilmarinen agreed to forge the Sampo, a wonderful and mysterious object in return for marrying the daughter of Louis, mistress of the, of the dark Northland. Ilmarinen labors day and night, but without success. But on his fourth attempt, he finally succeeds and delivers to Louis the magical object who buries the Sampo in a copper seam, nine fathoms deep within a hillside and secured behind nine unbreakable locks. The Kalevala does not say what the Sampo looked like or exactly what it was for, other than that it was a source of great wealth and highly desired. The only description is in an alternative name given for the Sampo the bright lid. So this is a, a passage from my account of visiting Onkelo during its construction. Our last stop was the, to visit the research tunnels where, the en where engineers are perfecting the final method for disposal. There were three. One was busy with engineers digging a borehole. Another, where they had been testing how to close each disposal tunnel was blocked by a concrete seal. But the last, in Goldilocks fashion, was open. It was much narrower than the access tunnels we had passed through, blind at one end and coldly illuminated by arc lights. The walls were draped untidily with cables, 
and a generator and spools of more cables had been left at the back. Set into the ground, evenly spaced, were three enormous circular concrete lids, each one perhaps one and a half meters across with a small square hatch in the center. Despite the clutter of construction materials, the only word I could think of to describe the tunnel was holy. This is where the final disposal of spent fuel rods will take place, a sanctuary set aside for the deep future. It was unexpectedly profoundly moving. The disposal tunnels and access roads will be backfilled to the surface, but if anyone in 10,000 years time was tenacious enough to dig their way down here, this is what they would see. I felt jolted forwards in time, as if my own feelings suddenly mingled with the future visitors' rush of excitement. As the concrete seals were lifted and the gleam of the copper canister caught the light again, after thousands of years of being buried upright in the dark, would they feel horror, exhilaration, or reverence? I could imagine their gasps echoing in the small tunnel as they raised the concrete seals to reveal the shining, bright lid. Would the Sampo still be remembered here? Might they even think they had discovered the source of the myth? I asked our guide if anything else would be left in the tunnels before they were backfilled. They'll probably take anything of value, he replied. But it looked to me that much of what would be left down here would speak of the people who laid this vault in the earth. Not just the disposal chambers and their thousands of canisters, but the mesh and concrete coated walls, the deep score marks, the pipes that will carry hot water to the engineer's showers. I was startled to realize that of all the many roads I traveled since I'd walked across the new bridge over the Firth of Forth at the start of my journey, this one I was standing on hundreds of meters below ground was the one most likely to survive as a future fossil. When nothing of the road network remains above ground, the 42 kilometers of roads through Onkolo will still be here, backfilled but intact, with their smooth surfaces and arcane signs, like the emergency exit markers with their running figures. I wondered whether a future intruder would read these as a, one, a warning to flee from unseen dangers or an encouragement, an invitation to hurry on through the door into the dark. Finland's report on final disk disposal predicts what will be left of Onkelo beyond one million years. Plate tectonics are unlikely to have much effect. Serial glaciations may erode the surface level plugs and some of the backfill tunnels, but equally over this time frame, sedimentation may push them deeper underground. After tens of millions of years, the repository will perhaps have risen to the surface, wearing away the access tunnels and exposing some disposal chambers to the air. If this happens, some deposited material is likely to be dispersed into the environment. But by this time, it will be no more deadly than naturally occurring uranium. Over the very long term, it may even come to resemble the uranium bodies it was drawn from. The copper canisters may have been partially reduced to copper sulfides, but because of their low solubility, they ought to be largely intact even at this late stage, raising the possibility that still gleaming remnants of the final deposition may be excavated 400,000 generations after it was sealed underground. Jerry, our guide, beckoned us farther down the access tunnel where a new branch had been begun. It was totally dark, but as he shone a light on the walls, they suddenly erupted with life. Our waving torches revealed a tangled undergrowth of green lines, spray painted by geologists tracing the cracks and fault lines in the bedrock. Each one was numbered and the numbers and red dots looked like flowers and buds, like vines living in the deepest rock, clinging to the dark walls of Onkelo for all time. <laughs> 